So, um, and then just so that you know, those of you that have your cameras on, we love to see your faces. Those of you that have your cameras off in the video recording, you'll just show up as a, um, a, a black box with your name there. So we encourage you to turn on your cameras if you're open to that. Um, and in fact, for a moment now, I'm going to stop sharing my screen that has the uh, question for the unofficial start so that we can all, if you click on um, the little icon towards the top of your screen for the gallery view, you can see many more faces versus the one big talking head. And we encourage you, invite you all to unmute yourselves for a second and wave, look at the camera and either look to your left or to your right or up or down kind of Brady Bunch style where we're all saying hello to each other. <laughs> yeah, even though we can't actually see each other. So welcome everybody. We're so happy to welcome Janine and Jared back uh, for this follow-up Q&A on the Paycheck Protection Program or PPP and the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program or EIDL. So some of you probably have noticed a lot is changing, seems to be changing every day. And so we'll hear a little bit about whether there are any updates uh, in terms of whether and how soon the additional stimulus package might be approved and, and for how much. And then really this is an open and a time to just hear what kinds of questions people have and see what kind of uh, information Janine and, and Jared can share with us. And again, they have both a combination of direct experience with applying for these different loan programs, either for their own organizations they work for or with other organizations they're helping. Uh, so they have both some of that technical knowledge as well as that firsthand practical experience. So very glad to have them back today. I am going to before we do introductions, go, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again for a moment because we wanted to start off just telling you a little bit more about what CORE is. I know some of you may know the ins and outs of CORE and who we are as the CORE consultants. Others of you, this may be new or, or you're not quite sure who we are and what we do. So I thought we'd do a little bit of an overview. So if you are not familiar with CORE, it stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, so CORE, and it's both a funding model and what we're calling a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. So that just means that we're constantly looking for ways to bring different people together from different sectors and different roles. So funders, policymakers, service providers, community members, and looking at what is it that we're all trying to work together? What can we do collectively to achieve more equitable health and well-being for people in our community? And through a lot of methods of, you know, getting a lot of different feedback and input and ideas from all these different partners, we've really gone from core being the initial funding model that the county and city of Santa Cruz adopted a few years ago to provide funding for nonprofits to provide safety net services. We um, broaden that definition of core beyond just that funding model to really look at, again, how do we use this as a framework to inspire and ignite collective action and uh, all in the name of achieving an equitable, thriving, resilient community. And so the, this core mission and vision that you see on the screen is really what drives our work, uh, what has driven our work over the last couple of years. And, and so when I talk about our work, I'm talking about myself, uh, Nicole Young, and my colleague, who's also co-facilitating this morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Nicole Lezen. So we are two of the, the lead core consultants um, for this initiative. And when we think, when we talk about equitable health and well-being, we're really talking about how do we uh, look at not only programs and practices, but policies and systems, uh, what needs, what's working well and needs to be strengthened, what needs to be changed so that across the lifespan, everybody in our community has equitable opportunities to experience these eight core conditions for health and well-being. Um, these are just different ways of categorizing or saying these are the things that we all need in life, right? To be ha happy, healthy, thriving, um, again, from birth through end of life. And so 
we won't say a whole lot more about these uh, today, but just know that this is, you know, when, we, when we've been hosting these core coffee chats, um, each of our topics have in one way or another touched on one or more of these core conditions for health and well-being. They're all very interconnected, interdependent. So a lot of what we'll be talking about today is uh, in the realm of economic security and mobility, not only for individuals, but for organizations that are uh, there to serve and support uh, families in our, and individuals in our community. And so that's, I think, all I'll say about CORE at this point, that we have a lot of other background information. If anyone is ever interested in, in <laughs> reading up more on CORE, we always like to see new faces and, and new organizations in these CORE coffee chats, which are really just a new uh, way, new method that we've started recently to, again, create opportunities for shared learning, um, develop shared knowledge, and uh, look at opportunities for that collective action in order to, and in, in right now, uh, respond to some of the impacts and long-term effects of, of COVID-19. So the core coffee chats are right now very focused again on the immediate response to COVID. Um, but as we move forward, we envision expanding the, the range of topics and other kinds of trainings and learning opportunities under this broad umbrella that we're calling the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact um, that will include both some new learning opportunities as well as some of the things that we've been doing for the last few years around training and technical assistance. Okay, so at this point, we'd like to get a better sense of who all is on the Zoom meeting this morning. So we're gonna encourage you to keep using the chat box. And at this point, go ahead and type in your name and the organization or group that you're representing today. And we'll uh, call out a few of the names just to acknowledge some of you. And again, for the recording, because the chat box won't appear in the recording, it helps to, to know who some of the people are. So good morning, Jennifer from ASR. Good to see you. And Carol from NAMI. And Frenny from Monterey Bay Economic Partnership and Greg. Greg is one of our core steering committee members. So it's nice to see him again. And Andrea from Boys and Girls Club and Shaz from the Power Valley Chamber of Commerce. And now names are starting to scroll by faster than I can read them. <laughs> <laughs> so we welcome you. Keep, keep uh, introducing yourselves. It helps to kind of see uh, who all is on here and what organizations you represent. Got Nadia from PBUSD. And John Balutz from the Health Project Center, welcome. Juliet from Predictably Well. Shandara from Yoga for All Movement. Lucy, we've got a couple of you from Dentana Wilderness Alliance. Mm -hmm. Nice to see you. Some of you I recognize from the session last week, so it's nice to have you back. I imagine there's uh, more questions that have come up even within the last week. And so speaking of last week, um, some of you might remember or saw that we started off um, just showing a summary of your responses in the registration form last, in last week's session. So we were asking, has your organization already applied for the Paycheck Protection Program and or the Economic Injury Disaster Loan? So you can see that in last week's session, uh, most people had not applied for either. Um, a few were in process or in the process of applying or had submitted and, and were waiting for a response. But you can see that very few and really the only person who had said yes and that their PPP application had been approved was one of our presenters, <laughs> David Doolin. And so this time, uh, for those of you that signed up again and answered these questions, this is just as of last night when I summarized these. Uh, we have kind of this, about the same proportion of, of people that have either not applied yet or they're in process or pending, but uh, more of you this time that have uh, submitted your applications and been approved. And so we're also curious to hear from you as we go throughout this morning if you uh, have experienced particular things that you think would be helpful for others to know. We encourage you to share that as well. And so now I'm going to um, turn it over to Janine and have Janine, who is a, formerly an accountant and is now doing consulting, um, share with us some of the updates that she's been hearing about in terms of the status of PPP and EIDL 
um, again, I know a lot has been has been changing very rapidly. So Janine, you want to unmute yourself and do you want me to share anything on my screen um, from your I think for right now nothing to nothing to share visually um, the updates I can give the obviously the bad news is that the current funding for PPP and idle has run out um, it ran out on Thursday of last week the good news there's actually two pieces of good news um, so one is that Congress is actively working right now to pass um, additional funding for the PPP. Um, what I've been reading is that they're looking to push through um, 300 billion. So the, the original funding for the PPP was 300, about 350 billion. So this additional 300 billion is sizable compared to what the initial allocation was. So that's exciting. Um, the other piece of good news is that the Fed, um, I think it wasn't last week, but end of the previous week, gave some incentives to banks to hold these loans. Um, and so that's also exciting because initially, yeah, whenever that was, it seems so long ago now, <laughs> whenever we last talked, um, that there was, you know, I was hearing just like a lot of issues with banks getting to banks not pushing through applications and stuff like that. So I also think that these new incentives that the Fed is offering for banks to hold these loans are going to encourage lenders to, um, to push through applications. There's also been some other, um, I don't know what you would call them, but like other, other types of financial institutions like PayPal, Square, um, and Intuit, which has QuickBooks, um, have been approved to uh, push through applications for the PPP. So that's all really exciting in terms of just like, there seems to be a lot of um, forward momentum and traction. And although there is no current funding right now, Congress is working on allocating funds for PPP. What I have been reading in terms of the bill that they're trying to push through right now mentions PPP, it does not mention idle. I would assume that any package that they would push through that's gonna fund PPP would also have provisions for idle, but in full transparency, everything I've read has just been mentioning PPP. That's the, for lack of a better word, just like sexier of the two for whatever reason, um, and is just getting like a lot more attention. So I don't, I don't necessarily think because IDLE hasn't been mentioned that it won't be funded, but I just haven't read all the things I've been reading have been focused on PPP. So um, in theory, that could be as soon as Congress like green lights the funds and everything, um, any lenders are green lit to open app applications and process applications again. So anybody that has like an application that's pending or they were thinking about submitting, I would think that you should work with your bank to make sure you have all your documents and everything if you haven't submitted yet. And then um, as soon as the funding is greenlit again, like be there, you know, at 8 a.m. on, <laughs> you know, day one to to work with your lender to get that application pushed through. And if you've already applied, you don't have to do anything, you're already in line. So um, the good news is it seems like there's just general support for this program um, and that they will also, I've also heard that they expect to continue to allocate funds as long as there's need for the program. So just because this 300 billion has been allocated doesn't necessarily mean that this is the last of the funds. I mean the situation is evolving, so who's to say, but um, that seems to be kind of like what the consensus is right now. Thanks, Janine. And I see a couple questions, I see a hand raised and a couple questions that are starting to come through, and we also had some from the registration forms that we wanted to make sure uh, we got to, but let me actually start with, um, Shandara, is, is your hand raised to ask a question? Do you want to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask? Yeah, thank you all. I know the patience with Zoom and figuring out uh, what to look at each other yeah. or the cat or what's going on. Um, so thank you for that. I So I had a question, Janine, um, and totally granted that I imagine Santa Cruz Community Bank just got like totally 
inundated with applications. But a really funny thing happened with PPP and just in that I sent in an application and just, but I, it, it was, it went out into the ether. It was such an elusive application process. I didn't get like a confirmation email that an application was even received. And then it was like two weeks later, it was like told it was ran out of funds. A week before that, Santa Cruz Community Bank was like, we're no longer prioritizing um, applicants that aren't our customers. My bank isn't a preferred lender. So are, are is it, I don't know. I'm just maybe asking just general questions. What was that application process like? And was it normal to not get a confirmation back? And then the same thing kind of happened with Idle. I only got one confirmation email from the numerous loans that I've applied for. And so I'm just, I'm kind of curious if, if we should check back in about that or just assume that money's run out and just not even bother. I, I would make sure, are you like, 100% sure you submitted like a real application and not like an interest form like a lot of the banks have like interest forms of, But if you submitted like a true application um, I would think that you would be in the queue, but I would also Be calling the bank to check in because and just okay. make sure that there's nothing missing and that you're They've processed your application because you could submit information, but they actually they actually have to like send your information they have to process your information your application if that makes sense so there's you like give them your information and then they like do this other thing for you right um so i would just be checking in to make sure that to understand just what the status of your application is and that you talk to a person um, and that they can give you some information of is it pending is it approved is it processing you know where is it in the situation, in the like status of all these things. If you, if you've already submitted an application with them, to some extent you're sort of stuck with them because you can't, it's not a good idea to submit multiple applications through multiple banks. So um, for a variety of reasons, but you don't wanna get, in theory, if you had two applications in the system, like with the in the banking system, they could somehow see that there's multiple applications and deny both of them because you can't have two. Um, it's just kind of a, a messy situation to have two, and you would never want to be if you got approved for both. That's like not allowed. <laughs> so like you would be in a bad situation if you ever had two applications going at the same time. Uh, are you saying, can I sorry, jump in? Just to for clarify. Clarity. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. I don't know what you're clarifying, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <ahead. laughs> so you can't have two PPP loans and two, but you could have one PPP and one idle. Thank you. you. That one is what each, I was going to ask. But okay. Not, yeah. <laughs> okay. So I didn't, I didn't mess it. I didn't like equalize anything. Oh, yeah. no, no, no. Like, it wasn't a double negative. negative. Okay. But the key, okay, well, the key takeaway there, and I think Janine, you had talked about this last week also, to be a squeaky wheel. Yeah, to we, even though we know that banks are probably overwhelmed and overloaded, that it doesn't hurt to keep following up. And Jared, were you going to add something to that? No. Okay. Um, and so let's um, let's go ahead and transition and start to taking some of the questions that had come through earlier in the registration forms. Go ahead in the meantime. Keep if you have other questions that are coming to mind, type them into the chat box, and we'll go through as many as we can this morning. Um, Deborah, I, I saw that you asked one in the in the chat box before we get to that one. So a few others we're going to ask first. So this one came through in one of the registration forms asking, is a 501c6 organization eligible for the PPP and EIDL loans? And if so, are they still available? Um, and kind of a follow-up question to that is, what immediate resources are available for chambers of commerce? So, so if organizations... Yeah, 501c6 is not, um, is not, what do you call it, cannot qualify for PPP. They do qualify for EIDL. Um, and then let me just go back to my notes. Yeah, so only 501c3, 501c19, which is like a veterans organization, and then tribal businesses are eligible for PPP. Um, but you could you could apply for idle, um, but obviously that is also not funded right now. So you can't <laughs> you technically can't submit an application for that right now. And Janine, in the 
Google Doc that you've been that you created that you've been updating as as new information emerges. Um, I saw that you had added some other alternative funding resources. Would any of those, like the SBA bridge loan, the SBA debt relief, would any of those apply to chambers of commerce? I don't know 100% because I didn't dig as deeply into okay. those. Um, I, those. I was looking at those and they do have, it seems like the bridge loan is still is like associated with idle like it's supposed to be a bridge until you get your idle loan um if that's taking longer um so i would assume that would have t the sort of same type of requirements as idle but idle is a very like basic business loan so almost there's it has almost no restrictions on the way that you spend it and has almost no restrictions on who qualifies for it so i, I would assume that like almost anybody can get that but i haven't looked into it in detail and then the other one i forget what the other one is um oh it's like the seven uh like seven a loan which is just like a general small business loan also like a very basic loan that one does currently carry a um requirement of credit elsewhere meaning like you have to have exhausted all your other means of being able to find credit elsewhere so like the S, this loan from the 7a loan is like the last possible means of finding credit um so you could apply for any like small business loan from like a just regular lender or whatever not necessarily sba loan um so those are kind of the other options i also dropped in a link to Kiva is doing a 0% loan for up to 15K right now. So that's another option. Um, and then I, I'm trying to think if there, what else I had in there in terms of alternate financing. Um, Share my screen because I have it up. And then also for, for everyone, I uh, typed in the link to this Google Doc that Janine created. It's in the chat box. It's also, I sent it out in the emails. Um, and so, that's something that you might want to keep checking back because Janine's been great about staying on top of these things and finding other resources. And so she keeps updating this document as she learns uh, new information. So are you all seeing the Google Doc that says alternative funding sources? So it's part of a, of a longer document that she created. But this is the, these are some of the things that she's talking about right now. How about, um, should we go to the next question? Nicole, do you want to ask that one about? Um, I will, some? yeah. We had a couple questions about documentation requirements and how loan funds can be used. So specifically, will we need to demonstrate the use of PPP funds as a replacement revenue stream or demonstrate lost revenue in order to use PPP in place of those funds? And Jared, I wonder if you could comment on that from your perspective with Monarch and trying to figure out how to juggle revenue streams and, and the accounting part of this. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I can comment on this. And this is probably um, most germane to nonprofits, uh, just because the nature of nonprofits, we set our fiscal year budgets, and we've already identified revenue sources to fund the certain outcomes uh, that we have identified programmatically. Uh, and so for, and I'm just going to speak uh, for what we're, what we're doing at Monarch Services, because uh, that's, that's where my knowledge base comes from. It's not like I have, you know, uh, a, a professional accountant or anything. Um, but basically what we've been doing is we've been work, working with our funders to uh, submit budget allocations or budget modifications to our, our, our original uh, funding request and approval. Um, so for example, let's say we had a pinpoint foundation that was for $50,000 and it was funding our children and youth program, basically the salaries of our children and youth coordinators. If we, get, if we receive funds from the PPP, we're going to be using those funds to basically pay for the children and youth uh, salaries at least through June 30th, right? So now we need to figure out and work with pinpoint of what flexibility do we have with those currently allocated funds? Can we uh, do a budget modification and maybe add some different expenses that were not uh, on the original uh, budget. So for instance, maybe we can uh, incorporate client aid, uh, direct client pass through to some of the, the clients that we're working with, or maybe we can be flexible and, and add some additional operating expenses to those loans or to the, to the grants. Um, 
as it relates to the the revenue loss, I guess that would be um, uh, you know unique to the uh, each individual entity. If you can demonstrate that you initially had revenue and you lost that, then I think that as long as you feel comfortable with being able to demonstrate that to your auditors, then you could just use the the PPP loans as a revenue replacement. Um, for the most part though, I think you really need to get creative. And now if you get those loans, you basically have this influx of revenue. And how are you going to be able to delineate that as the PPP, 75% needs to go to my payroll. Well, I've already allocated my payroll expenses. So what am I gonna do with all of these pre-allocated payroll? And that's really what you need to focus, what we are focusing on um, to be able to do that. Uh, and some of the things that I think I mentioned last time is we've reached out to our uh, funders. Uh, foundation funders have been uh, outstanding. If they've dedicated uh, or allocated grants to fund specific programs, they've allowed us to restricted grants, uh, allowing us more flexibility to be able to uh, move those funds around. Uh, the biggest thing that we are concerned about, me specifically, is the idea of uh, supplanting because a large portion of our revenue comes from state uh, and federal pass-through money. And uh, because this PPP loan, if you get the forgiveness, it's not really a loan anymore. That for it to be a loan, you'd have to repay it. So then it's really treated as a grant. And the funding source for that is federal money. And so we can't take already allocated state, local, and, and foundation funding for these programs, and then take this, this PPP loan and say, well, we're gonna move these out and we're gonna use the PPP to, play, uh, to pay for that. So that's just something that we are really cognizant of, of trying to figure out and working with the grantors are what are allowable expenses um, to our current revenue sources. And I know that was just a lot kind of there, but those are my thoughts there. If there's any questions to that <laughs> or Thanks, any Jared. clarification needed. Jenny, do you have anything to add to Jared's suggestions? Because <laughs> that is like totally out of my wheelhouse. Um, okay. I'm well, just laughing. It's kind of a team effort then. Sounds really complicated. <laughs> I mean, again, the idea, and, and the great thing is nonprofits are already structured to be able to provide this evidence because nonprofits use uh, fund accounting, which basically delineates, here's all of my funding sources, and here's the revenue, basically the amount of funding, and here's the expenses that we're allocating. What we're going to do is we're gonna create another funding source for the PPP if we get it, and say we get the X amount of dollars, and now we're gonna allocate the expenses over this time period. And you know, again, unless you're gonna increase your expenses, which is an, a lever that you have, you need to figure out then, you have a fixed amount of expenses that has already been allocated, how are you going to allocate that around? So it is, it is a puzzle. Uh, and a challenge, it's a good challenge to have for, for nonprofits, for, uh, for for profit businesses, you don't really have that fixed revenue, so it's a little bit easier, but then the question is gonna be, how can we make sure that we have the appropriate documentation to say we got this revenue and here's the expenses, so we use them appropriately. Um, but I, you know, I would just recommend, there's a lot of, of material on fund accounting principles. Um, it's very easy. Uh, in theory, but you know, I think we have a lot of non-accountants on the call, so thanks for helping us see that and visualize it. Nicole, do you want to share another question? Yeah, let me just ask though before we move on to the next one, Jared, are there any suggestions you have about what kind, like is there any additional steps to take in terms of documentation or so yeah, that sure. nonprofits have kind of that appropriate backup? Yeah, so again, you think about, um, and coming from, I, I wasn't an auditor, so you, you, we think about it from an audit lens. So at the end of the year, if you're a nonprofit, you have to go through your audit. And the, one of the main things that the auditors are looking for is, here's the expenses that you've allocated. Have you used those, uh, or here's the revenue, right? Have you appropriately used and allocated expenses, basically allowable expenses to each of your individual um, funding sources. Um, and so for the payment, uh, for the payroll, the PPP loan, right? The, th the two things that we talked about is you need, a, you need to at least spend 75% of the aggregate loan uh, to payroll. And so that, that's going to be one of the things that you want to say, here's my payroll backup. And 
over the, the you know, until June 30th or whatever that the terms are of your loan and saying 75% of my overall loan was allocated to this, um, uh, to the PPP loan. Uh, Janine brought up a great point. If you're a for-profit business, having a separate bank account allows you to say, here's the revenue. So here's the cash influx from the loan and here's the expenditures coming out from the loan and here's the type of expenditures. For nonprofits, you just, you know, what we're gonna do is set up a grant. We, we use grant designation. You can say a fund source designation, but let's just say you, you create a, a grant code, whatever, 99, and you allocate your loan revenue to that and all of the expenses that you intend to pay for it and it's broken out by your GL, so you'll have a payroll GL, right? Some of the other allowable expenses were mortgage interest, uh, uh, rent and utilities, right? So you think about it, okay, so I have these rent and utility GLs, and in aggregate, I spend out that loan over the duration that I'm supposed to, the next 60 days, June 30th, I think was the original uh, date, and then you just make sure that your, your percentages are 75% has to be allocated to that payroll GL that you have, to that grant that you created, and then that's the backup that you would use, right? So as an auditor, they will look at that, um, and the key here is um, you need to make sure that you have the evidence that you're not using other revenue sources uh, for those expenses that you are applying to the PPP loan, uh, or vice versa. You, you can't basically say, I spend a dollar, and I'm gonna use I'm gonna charge the PPP loan and my existing grant revenue sources because um, then you basically get $2 in revenue for that $1 in expenses. That comes out very easy on an audit, but that's one thing to avoid um, doing, especially if a lot of your grants, uh, which for a lot of the nonprofits that I'm familiar with are structured in errors. You basically would give them a grant claim of the expenditures that you've had for a previous month, right? Um, and so it's just really clear and um, the need is to make sure you delineate those expenditures um, to those funding sources. Another Thanks. complicated example. Yeah, I know. but you explained it so well. Thank you. Wow. Um, so there was another question that came through in a registration form and I know Janine, you um, provided some detailed responses in an email um, for this person that asked, but we thought it would be good to ask it on this live chat as well. Um, so someone was saying, we have concerns about what to do about our long-term lease liability and how to cover that. Um, and it's, so if there are any suggestions you can share from the response you um, sent me this morning, that would be great. And this question came from someone who's a sole proprietor that's trying to figure out whether PPP and or idle is a, is a viable path um, for them. But also I, could, I imagine this could apply to nonprofits as well. So. What do you yeah, have to so say? The, yeah. The short answer is to Jared's point that he just mentioned, PPP is really meant to be used primarily for payroll. You can use up to 25% of it for uh, rent. You can also use it for mortgage interest. You can't use it for mortgage principal. So just worth mentioning that. But idle would be kind of the better loan option because for a variety, it's that if you really were concerned about rent or, or mortgage payments, that would be what you would that would be the better loan. So I have a lot of like a lot of notes on this because um, one of my girlfriends and um, sort of clients I've been working with, she's in a similar situation. A lot of organizations that are ceasing operations right now, they still need to pay their rent or their, pay their mortgage. Um, so. The first thing I would say to do is to reach out immediately to your landlord and try to negotiate the lease. Um, and what my friend was doing is she drew up some language with a lawyer basically saying, look, we're not gonna pay anything while shelter in place is happening. Um, and then we will start repaying. And they came up with a, a term, like a 12, they're gonna repay it over 12 months. Um, starting like the third month after shelter in place is lifted basically to say like look, you know, this is what we can commit to um, And to still like make make basically a deal with the landlord about what you're gonna pay It's unlikely that you will Be able to get out of paying any rent like you're still gonna owe that rent money if you miss three You know if you're not gonna pay for three months or whatever it is You're still gonna owe that 
total three months rent, but can you pay it off over time um, and just try to strike a deal with them? Um, also worth mentioning, if you are paying a mortgage, you actually probably have a lot easier um, time negotiating with your mortgage lender um, to put a hold on your mortgage. You would most likely um, just pause payments and the number of subsequent payments you'll have will still be the same. So if you have you know, 300 payments left, you're still gonna have 300 payments left, but you can just stop paying those for a little while and then start up again. Um, so think about that. Um, the other thing I wanna mention, which is not pretty, but if you are a sole proprietor, you, you have a lot of risk for not paying your lease. Um, if you're a sole proprietor compared to an LLP or an LLC or some other type of organization that S Corp, C Corp, whatever, you, the liability for that lease lies on you as an individual person versus your company. You and your company are the same. So the bank or whoever, whoever is your landlord can come after your personal assets. So that's just, I say that to be honest and frank and to sort of give a heightened awareness for what your um, liability could potentially be if you were to default on your lease. So that's mostly just to underscore, try to work with your landlord <laughs> on, um, on like whatever, whatever deal you can make. Um, it's also important to think about even if you were to skip out or whatever on, on your lease, the landlord likely is not going to find a new tenant right now. It's in their interest to work with you. So especially if you're like, look, I, I'm not going to be in business right now, but in three months when things open up back again, you know, I ex fully expect to be a good tenant again, like try to, try to figure something out with them. Um, to that same extent, if, it would be good to go back and look at your lease and see if anybody else, like if did you have a spouse or somebody else guarantee the lease, they're also on the hook for the liability if you were to default on the lease. So those are just things to know, but all to sort of kind of underscore, um, try to work something out with your landlord. Almost every city and county right now is doing um, a moratorium on evictions, so you're not going to even for commercial as well as residential. So likely nothing is really going to happen in this moment, but you still need to be cognizant of what your liability is. Um, Thanks, Janine. I see we have a, a few more questions coming into the chat. Nicole, what's, what's the next one that you wanna? Well, I just wanted to highlight that Janine has been chatting as well while she's doing these great answers. So just to, uh, there was a question in case people missed it about if your loan was denied, would would the funds automatically go back and start filling in the ones that were denied? And Janine had more good advice, which was to find out why you were denied. So if anybody's in that situation, the question was, should, is it worth reapplying? So that's going to vary for everybody, but it's it would be really important to know what the reason was before you reapply um, and not to assume that you that, the, that your prior application would be in the pool if you were already denied and you knew that. So that's one thing just to call out from the chat. And then Janine, a couple of people still have questions about the differences between the two loans um, and, and how the grant provision works. Could you just do a quick recap of that for those who are, are really new to this? Yeah, so the PPP is called the Paycheck Protection Program. So the whole point of that program is to really fund payroll um, during this like uncertain time. And it's a loan, but it's a forgivable loan. So up to like, tech, well, it's almost all of it will be forgivable um, under certain stipulations. There's certain reasons why you would lose out on the forgiveness, which is if you don't retain the same number of employees and you don't retain the same compensation levels for folks. Um, but generally that loan, it's primarily free money if you qualify for these forgiveness options, um, but it's primarily meant for payroll. The IDLE is a more general business loan. Um, the, 
it's I forget exactly what the interest rate is on it. I think it's like two percent or something. I forget off the top of my head. Pretty low interest rate. Uh, generally, not really much restrictions in terms of what you can use the loan funds for. Versus the PPP is really strict about it's primarily to be used for payroll. Um, the idol has this magical 10k grant it's being called a grant the grant is kind of a misnomer but it's really the ten thousand dollars is really in advance on the loan so you apply for this loan and then in theory you're supposed to get this advance quickly the the law says three days it's looking like closer to 15 to 30 days before people are getting this funding um, the reason it's being called a grant is because that 10k advance you don't have to pay back um, and so that's why people are calling it a grant because it's kind of free money. Um, but it, it is in timing with a loan application. You, you cannot get the $10,000 without applying for the loan. It's also important to, I didn't say this last time, but I should mention it now. Um, you can get up to $10,000. It's $10,000 per employee. So if you don't have 10 people on your uh, if you don't have 10 employees, you're not going to get $10,000. Uh, I was reading a comment from somebody that they're like, we thought we were going to get, we're a nonprofit and we have two employees. <laughs> we thought we were going to get $10,000 and we only got two and we're sad. Um, so it's per employee. So if you don't have 10 just, employees. Just to clarify, not, it's, a, okay. it's a thousand per employee up to 10,000 total. Up to 10,000. Yeah. yeah. And Jane, uh, another question related to how the different loans can be used was whether independent contractors could be paid with PPP money. They, they cannot because right. they're, they're not employees. Right. So independent contractors from a business finance perspective are seen as like cost for whatever cost center they serve. So they're either like a marketing cost or an engineering cost or I don't know whatever other costs they may be that but they're seen as like a business expense they're not seen as payroll um independent contractors can file for unemployment um under the new pandemic unemployment assistance program so if you're concerned about paying you know your people and you want to make sure that they're paid they can file for unemployment that way um they also as individuals can file for the ppp themselves because they're like a they're a they're their own business and so they could file for the ppp and pay themselves if that makes sense okay thank you are there other questions that people want to share through the chat or by raising your hand okay i'm not seeing any nicole did there oh there's deborah's raised her hand. Um, I just wanted to clarify one thing. So thank you so much for that overview about the two loans. And but then at the right at the end, um, Janine, you said so a PPP could be applied for to pay yourself. So if your income is down, you could apply for that as a sole proprietor to pay yourself, or only as an independent. I mean, it sounded like an independent contractor is a sole proprietor. So yeah. So the PPP is available to nonprofits and to businesses. So if you are um, and tribal entities and some other little things. Um, so if you are a business, a sole proprietor, you could apply for that for yourself. You could, if you're an independent contractor, you could apply for it for yourself because you are a small business. But the nonprofit wouldn't be applying for it and then using it to pay their independent contractors since they're not employees. Got, Got it. it. Thank you so much. That clarifies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So it would make sense to apply for both then, one for perhaps income and the other for rent and utility and other kind of liabilities like that. Exactly. You could also, we mentioned this last time, you could also use the PPP for payroll for the two and a half month period that it covers. And then you could use the idle for payroll after that. So, cause the PPP only is for, is only for two and a half months of payroll and payroll related expenses or whatever. So in my mind, that's not very long. Um, if you needed additional funding subsequent to that, you could take out idle, which is a more typical loan. Jared, we're getting a couple requests for any documentation you may have over what you shared. 
about the revenue streams. Yeah, I was actually, um, that's what I'm working on now, is just creating a fake, uh, uh, basically statement of revenue and expense report that we use for our um, audit, back, uh, audit documentation. Now okay. Add that to the chat box in just a second. So I just got to. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. As like an example of, again, just, how, and then I'll add it real quick. Discuss it real quick. Just give me one minute. We'll give you as many minutes as you'd like. Um, another question that, that came in is when the idol is back up, what documents should people have ready to apply? Janine? Uh, I need to look at that. I mean, it's a more, it's a more typical business loan. So mm -hmm. regular loan stuff. I mean, it's the, the difference between the idol and the PPP the PPP, you have to calculate what two and a half months of your payroll is. And so there's um, like some, what do you call it, tax documents and stuff like that, 990s and whatever that you might use to calculate that amount. The idle is like a more just regular business loan. So they're just going to want to like be able to understand your credit worthiness and things like that. Um, there's no like special information that you would um you have to give them to prove your like to prove that you need it it's more that you're just applying for a loan so i i don't it's not a great phrase to say regular loan stuff but just like information on your organization your you know credit history things like that okay thanks and there's a question about, uh, and I think you kind of touched on this, but maybe answer it again. Um, do we need to apply for IDLE after PPP funds run out or can we do it before they do? So this kind of strategy about timing of the applications. You can apply for them both at the same time. I would just be mindful of the fact that they're both loans. And especially as Jared was going into with you know, being a nonprofit and things like that, is that what you do? Do you really need all of this funding right now? And how much funding do you re reasonably need? Um, and understand what is your real need before applying for both. And then understanding, okay, if my total need is 100K, I'm gonna get 25K from the PPP, and then I would like to apply for the idle for the balance. Do that, and I would apply for those at the same time. If you feel like the PPP is really going to carry you, then don't apply for the IDLE, you know, but just have a, a sort of an understanding of what is your total, you know, financial need, and then what you're, what are you going to get from one, what would you get from, um, what would you get from the other? Does that make sense? Donna? Question? I see that. Oh, yes, yes. Hi, Hi thanks. Um, I was wondering if you, you know, when the um, self-employed unemployment comes up later in, in the month, can you apply for both the PPP and the self-employed unemployment at the same time? I mean, in, in theory, they would be, um, I don't know, exclusive, right? Because if you're applying for the PPP, and you're paying yourself through that, you're not really unemployed, right? <laughs> you're still paying yourself. Right, so right. You're still getting income from that. If you, I mean, I think that's, from my personal perspective, I think you would want to weigh how much could you potentially pay yourself from the PPP versus how much you would potentially get from unemployment and understand which is the better deal for you. With the PPP, as everybody's discussed, this thing takes a while. The funding's mm -hmm. out, whatever. With unemployment, you're likely to get that, that to come through more quickly, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but I will say the sad news about the PUA, so the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance for Independent Contractors and Sole Proprietors, they just released what the amounts are for it. And to be honest, I was pretty disappointed the weekly benefit is $167. Mm -hmm. The max, the max benefit for on a like regular employee, like regular unemployment is $450 a week. So 167 compared to the 450 was like, I thought that was pretty sad. I thought, I actually thought that 
you would sort of say what your income stream was like you were an employee and they would give yeah. some benefit compared to that. But instead they're just giving a flat 167 a week. You will still qualify for um, the additional $600 a week um, as mm -hmm. part of the CARES Act supplemental unemployment insurance. So you'll get that, what is it? Seven sixty-seven a week for a little while. That six hundred dollars only runs through the end of July. No matter when you apply, you could apply the middle of June. You'd only get the six hundred bucks for two weeks. So it's kind of like you would want to just evaluate what's the better financial option for you. Um, if you were making a decent amount of money as a sole proprietor, the PPP might be a better bet for you because you're going to get more from that. Whereas unemployment is not a great, like, you know, is not a super great deal, but you're likely to get those funds are likely going to process a lot faster. Thank you to share to some other thoughts about unemployment in, in another document. So, um, and I just wanted to point out that Jared has pretty much instantaneously created a document for us in response to your questions that is posted in the chat as a PDF. Thank you. But the draft uh, profit and loss report. Jared, do you want to say a couple words about that? Sure, yeah. I mean, again, this is speaking from, this is how we structure our auto documentation and all of our, our um, financial reports at Monarch. So it's not like this is the best, you know, it's uh, the best benchmark, but this is just what we do. And, um, really the elements that um, I am making sure that we have um, for our backup documentation, obviously you have the, the time period that you're recording your expenditures. So I just at 4.15 through 6.30, because uh, it's, you know, two and a half months of payroll. I just created what we call would be like a, a grant. It's, it's, again, you just need to have some sort of indicator that says this number, in this example, it's 245, is associated with the payroll protection loan. I made up a number that we got $25,000 from it. And then here's the actual expenses broken out. Uh, you know what, to be honest, I am not sure if, if uh, taxes are an allowable expense. I just copied this from a, an existing document, but more or less this is what you're looking at. If you take the proportion of the 19,655 allocated to personnel related expenses, it's more than 75%, then you have the mortgage interest, utilities and rent. This is the high level summary document that we provide our auditors. Obviously, you're going to have to have the backup associated with this. So all of your actual payroll documents that say, yes, you paid the executive director the $1,345 in this two and a half month period, or yes, you paid the $3,500 in rent, you need to have that backup. I am not sure the level of backup needed uh, when you are or even the, how they're going to go about the loan forgiveness, if something like this is going to be enough uh, for your bank to say, yeah, okay, I see the expenditures, they, they meet the, the criteria. Obviously, you probably have to, to provide them your, your, um, payroll, uh, your payroll headcount because that was one of the other stipulations is you cannot cut your payroll headcount um, or you at least have to have the same as you did in February or whatever. Um, so anyway, I don't know if that answered the question, but this is this is the document that we are intending to use as one of the primary uh, backup documentation. Okay, thanks, Jared. We're coming close to the end of our official time together, but Janine has generously offered to stay a few minutes later if people still have questions. So keep those coming if you still have them. But in the meantime, we wanted to, for those of you who do need to hop off in a couple minutes, we wanted to thank you for joining us today. And a special thanks to Janine and Jared for continuing to share their expertise. I know from the responses we're already getting from people how helpful this has been in, in terms of the detail and just being in, in the weeds with us on, um, on those of you who are still in the process of applying or are still thinking about it. I also wanted to let you know that a week from today, same time, same channel, we have a conversation with Maria Cadenas from Santa Cruz Community Ventures and Maria Elena de la Garza and Paulina Moreno from Community Action Board about resources specifically for people who are undocumented. So if that's something that applies to your organization or your situation, please join us next week for that. And you should be getting a registration announcement from Nicole Young in the next day or two. 
And then another important piece before you leave is that we really take your feedback seriously. We're trying to do these chats every week um, and have different topics coming up and try to make them as relevant as possible, but also mix up some different topics like, like these with others. So if you uh, have an opportunity to answer that survey, please do. We, we look at every single one and we really appreciate it. And then some of you mentioned wanting to know more about CORE and you can see on this slide at the bottom, the uh, shared folder where there's everything you wanted to know about CORE and then some. So uh, please check that out if you'd like. And so let's see, do we have other questions for Janine and Jared before we hop off here? This looks like there's a question. Uh, oh, Jared's already responded, thank you. So it looks like Janine and Jared are taking care of questions as they hop up, thank you. Okay, Nicole, do you see any we've missed here? I think we've caught them all. We'll go through these again right. as um, when we save the chat um, and we'll, we'll send out um, the Q and A from the chat, but Deborah, I answered your question. That. Yeah, you can save it if, if there's a little uh, three dots next to where the chat, um, the two line is. If you click on that, you can save it yourself. And so we are at our official end time. So thank you all so much for joining us again today. I hope to see you again at another Core Coffee chat. Uh, if you need to uh, and leave the meeting, you are welcome to do so. Um, Janine and Nicole as and I will stay on, and Jared, I don't know if you still have a few more uh, minutes available. If anybody else has some lingering questions or wants to hear more about some of the unemployment insurance options that Janine um, mentioned earlier, she has some additional notes on that as well. I also wanted to say if you if you submitted a question that we didn't talk about, I did put notes. I did write some notes about it and then I dropped that link in. So um, I tried to answer those there if we didn't talk about it directly here. Great, thank you, Janine. Thanks, Janine. Okay. So as we um, linger for a moment, is there anyone that's still on the call that wanted to hear more about things like the unemployment insurance options or alternative funding sources. Donna, you have your hand up. Yes, thanks, Nicole. Yes, um, Janine said something that um, I thought contradicted something I had been reading, that if you did apply for um, self-employed unemployment, um, as a sole proprietor, as an independent contractor, um, that uh, the $600 would be retroactive to the time. It, is it retro? I thought you said, it oh, okay, yeah. misunderstood then. So, so it ends in July, but it's retro. Yes, it's retroactive okay. to whenever your claim starts. So whenever you were out of work. So it will be, and I'm, my understanding is that's true only for the independent contractor, sole proprietor. And that's not necessarily the case for like regular unemployment. So like, right. If you became unemployed today, or sorry, like two months ago, but you only filed today as like you got laid off or whatever, you wouldn't get that retroactive. But my understanding is for the PUA, Pandemic Unemployment Assistance PUA, which is specifically for sole proprietors, independent contractors, and gig workers, and things like that, that is retroactive. Okay, so, great, thank you. And they, there's a, Nicole shared out a link um, to something, a slide, I, or a couple of pages I put together on unemployment, and there's a link in that to the EDD site where they have their whole, like, spiel on unemployment. Um, so it's very, it's actually quite comprehensive. I will say, in general, the guidance for unemployment is a lot fuzzier <laughs> than the guidance for PPP or something like that. There seems to be a lot of room for interpretation and a lot of gray areas. Um, the system that is currently exists, you, you can only put so much information into that. I was working with a woman last week that had a very unique situation with her unemployment and we were like, 
almost laughing at how poorly she was able to represent like her situation mm -hmm. in, by using the check boxes and stuff in the system. Right, right, so, right. The one thing I will say that's great about unemployment in general is the burden is on the EDD to evaluate your situation and provide you with the unemployment that you are owed. They're asking that people who are independent contractors, if they think they could be misclassified as employees, file for regular unemployment. If they truly are independent contractors, to file for PUA instead. They've set up a whole new system for PUA that will be released next week. Um, so that they anticipate that entire system being as large as the total current EDD unemployment system right now. So it's just, we all I think need to have a bit of appreciation for the volumes of claims that this or, like organization is processing right now. Um, and they're doing their best to get people funds um, but you can imagine with the level of claims that have been coming in, it's crazy. And if they were with this expanded unemployment benefit that the Fed has put through, um, the, the system was never built for this. <laughs> so right. have patients do your best to try to adequately represent your situation. If they have an issue, they'll call you. They also have your payroll, you know, they have access to your tax filings and stuff like that, you know, your um, W-2s and things like that, like in the tax system. So it's on them to do their research to understand what your situation is and to allocate the right amount of funds to you. It's not your job to do that, which is good. Um, it's your job to apply and uh, make the claim. And one last question. Thank you so much for being so thorough. Um, is there how can i is there a way that i can find out what the application entails so that i can be prepared to get it done in advance or get it out and put it in firstly the pua or for regular unemployment for um the pua i i don't know what it looks like yeah so i i have no, i mean the regular the regular unemployment one because i've done it is pretty straightforward. You put in your work history, you put in how much money you made, blah, blah, blah. Um, I am curious if the PUA will go into the detail of understanding how much you were making in the past since it's a flat amount that they're cutting you anyways, right? Yeah, yeah. So you might, I could see in some ways where they would require more documentation because you're self-employed, but I could also see it being less since mm -hmm. they're just cutting you a straight amount, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, right, they'll just check the tax history and then right totally yeah. so okay. i think that's the part where there's a lot of unknowns because this is an entirely new thing and they like just built it and like no one's done it yet so okay. um that's what's a little bit more frustrating i think one of uh, one of my friends had suggested registering for with the edd site so that you have a registration complete so you register and like create an account and then you file a claim. So you could register right now and then you okay. can file your claim, um, you know, a week from today when supposedly the new site is going to be out. Oh, Janine, we actually idea. have a, we actually have a question in the chat about from, uh, from Carrie. She hasn't been able to claim, hasn't been able to complete her unemployment insurance registration to file a claim. The site hasn't been working for the last 24 hours and there's no one to talk to. Do you have any suggestions about how she could move forward to make a claim? I would try to just keep working with the website. I actually was on the website a few times yesterday trying to do some research for this and found that it was sort of sporadically pooping out for lack of a better word. Um, I assume the traffic on it is just skyrocketed, right? So I don't know if you wanna try going in at 6 a.m when you know there's probably less traffic on it but um that your best bet is to try to do what you can online because the phones are only open from 8 a.m to 12 p.m every day because they're spending the rest of that time working on processing claims so you can only the only way to reach them is to call them there is no email <laughs> so um I can't imagine what trying to call them would be like right now. <laughs> um, so I would try to do what the best you can to do it online and just keep trying. Um, and that's, I mean, unfortunately, I don't have better advice than that. Like the system is, is never made for the number of people that it's trying to serve right now. Like the average number of claims per week before this was like 30 to 50K. 
And I think they had like around 900K of claims like one of them in the last couple of weeks. And so it's just cray cray. Um, and then um, there was someone, I think Eduardo is still on the call who is interested in hearing about the alternative funding resources. And Eduardo will send out all these links again to these documents that uh, Janine has prepared. But Janine, you wanna say a few words? Yeah, I would say we, and the, the, call about, mm -hmm. the SBA ones are, are, is what they're sort of pushing. There's a bridge loan that seems from what I can tell to be in timing with an idle loan. So I'm not sure if that one's still available right now. The other loan is just like a regular SBA loan. It's called their 7A loan, which is for working capital. Um, that has this restriction of credit elsewhere where they are asking that you exhaust all other means for seeking credit before applying for that loan. Um, I also threw this thing in here, which I even hate to mention, but there's something called the Main Street Lending Program, which is such a... BS misnomer because <laughs> the minimum loan amount is for a million dollars. So I don't know any Main Street businesses that are taking out million dollar loans, but that's what it's called. So if you were a larger organization, you could pursue that loan. I also dropped a link in there for um, a loan from Kiva, which is a 0% loan for up to $15,000. Um, I also put in a bunch of links for grants. Uh, there's a lot of links for grants and grant applications in there for nonprofits. Um, there's a couple in there for small businesses. Um, so, I mean, if you're, if the idle isn't up and running soon and the PPP isn't up and running soon, I would just like talk to your bank about getting a regular small business loan um, and seeing what, what rates they would offer you. Interest rates are low, 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 low right now. So, any, you should be able to get a loan right now for a very affordable rate. Um, it's just going to also depend on, yeah, credit worthiness and things like that. Is that Thank helpful? Thank you. Okay, any final burning questions before we close the meeting today? Mm. Are you reading that one, Janine? Yeah. I'm going to read it out loud so it's on the recording. So we're a 501c6. I was encouraged to apply for a PPP with our bank. Their online PPP portal opened after funding was closed. However, they encouraged me to apply to have my application in if and when the next funding phase happens. I spent hours completing the application just to see we do not qualify. Do I need to reapply if and when the next phase launches and hopefully includes 501c6s? That's a unfortunate situation. Um, it's frustrating to think that they didn't understand that you wouldn't qualify being a 501c6 under the current program. Um, it will be interesting to say there has been a lot of criticism of the PPP program as a whole. And personally, myself, like, sure, it's like, a goodish program, but do I think that this is like the savior for all small businesses? Like, absolutely not. So, it will be interesting to see when this additional like funding legislation passes if they will just push through funds for the PPP as it stands, or if they will make modifications to that um, to that program. For example, I'm sure everybody has heard about these large public entities getting millions and millions and millions of dollars in loans from PPP. Um, and folks that are on this call haven't even gotten funding yet. Um, if it was really meant to be directed for small businesses and there is this other ma Main Street lending program that is for larger entities, why, why didn't they make the stipulations such to, to isolate out these larger businesses? Um, I've, I've read a decent amount of people with 501c6 um, status that are frustrated to not be able to access PPP. Um, so it's really remains to be seen. You do qualify for the idle. It is another note. It's a totally other thing with its own application. Um, so I know that doesn't help you in terms of you already did the work for this one application. Um, 
So I think it's just kind of TBD on what happens with um, the additional funding that comes through this week if they also make any modifications to the program at that time. Um, there's, in some ways, I wish that they would modify it <laughs> so that it would be more directed at small businesses and, and smaller organizations. But on the other hand, if they make changes to it or they create it in, you know, in the future, next week or the next month, they create a new program, then we have to learn the whole thing all over again. So um, I kind of see both sides of it, but people are, people are screaming for, for this money right now. And the fact that this program already ran out of money, people, there's so many people like in line already for it. I know that there's a lot of pressure to pass um, just additional funding. So I venture to guess they'll probably pass the funding this week with no changes and then potentially either seek to modify it again or create other programs for um, to address the concerns that people have had with this one. Thanks, Janine. Okay, I think that is it for our time today. Again, thank you all for hanging here until the very end. You got uh, uh, the extra, extra goodies in terms of the information. And thank you so much, Janine, for sharing all of your knowledge and preparing all these handouts that are going to be so helpful to so many people. Thank you all, and we'll see you again next time. Bye. Bye.